traditional. Uh, sorry about that, territory of Lilwat Nation. And I'm really excited to introduce Len Pierre, um, who is part of our Four Directions team as our cultural advisor and supporting the Not Just Naloxone curriculum. Uh, and he's um, agreed to join us today to talk about decolonizing our healthcare system. So with that, Len, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, Chika. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, Ace Whale, good day, everybody. Um, it's so good to see so many familiar faces and so many familiar names. I see lots of friends in our uh, virtual circle today. Um, so hi, Chika. Thank you. I raise my hands to each and every one of you to, for inviting me to be here um, and uh, in this virtual circle. Um, for uh, folks who do not know who I am, uh, my name is Len Pierre. My ancestral name is Polikulak. And I am Coast Salish from KT First Nation. Uh, I am zooming in uh, live from my home territory of KT uh, in North Langley in uh, Walnut Grove. Um, happy Friday, everybody. Uh, I've been invited here uh, today to share some teachings that I've acquired over the years um, around decolonizing healthcare, uh, healthcare systems. Uh, so I have prepared a little bit of a presentation um, I know we're here until about four o'clock um, and I would love to leave ample room for questions, comments, and just an open dialogue. Um, I know that I have a lot of, I'm just hearing some feedback on my end. Not everybody is muted. All right. Thank you. Hi, Chika. Um, so um, the space I really kind of want to hold um, together over the two hours really is uh, lightly and with humility. Um, I want to honor and recognize that anything decolonization, you know, brings up different feelings for each and every one of us. And that is largely due to our own exposure on um, decolonial work, uh, decolonial information and decolonial knowledge. Um, so we can be on any end of the spectrum where we're very new to this conversation, meaning that we don't know what decolonization is, you know, we haven't really engaged in conversations or, or learnings about it. And I also know that I have a lot of uh, relatives and colleagues and comrades on the line here who also um, have taught me in my professional practice about decolonial work. Um, so I really want to welcome everybody to this conversation with an open heart and an open mind. And my only hope is to be received in the same way. Um, and I also want to honor and recognize that, you know, some of our feelings around decolonization can be um, e emotional, you know, a sense of fear, a sense of guilt, or a sense of shame. Um, if that does occur for you um, throughout today's conversation, do not worry. I do not want to leave you there, especially on a Friday afternoon before we begin our weekend. My promise to you is I'll bring us back to a place of hope, healing, connection, and uh, inspiration. Uh, for the good work of, of, and the good value in decolonial work. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, for any Brene Brown fans out there, you know, sitting in our vulnerability um, is really where the magic happens. So if you have those feelings come up for you when we're talking about decolonization, um, it's a, that's important and that's a good sign um, that we are human beings, that we are part of a very important time in, in our history. Uh, a pivotal moment where we can even talk about decolonizing healthcare systems. You know, I can't imagine uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50, 100 years ago, that we would even be uh, gathering with the diversity that we see represented on the screen here, the knowledge and wisdom that is represented on the screen here. And then of course, you know, the amount of indigenous uh, healthcare uh, professionals that are represented on the screen here, you know, is something to celebrate. Um, so holding that space here for just talking about decolonizing our healthcare systems is something to be celebrated. And that's kind of the essence that I want to hold in today's conversation. With that in mind, I apologize in advance because we're going to do a little bit of truth telling at the same time. You know, as my daughter told me when she was doing a social studies class in grade four, she's like, Dad, you know, the world's not all sunshine and rainbows. I was like, oh my God, where are we going to take this conversation? And, and um, you know, they start learning about social justice in grade four. And so a lot of the conversations we're going to have today too really are about holding a mirror up to us as a health authority and the health uh, systems that we represent. And yes, FNHA is included in that because FNHA is still a baby um, and we FNHA leads a lot of the transformation and culture change that we want to see throughout all of the other health authorities. Um, but there has been a lot of growing pains um, and I've been with FNHA since about 2016 
and have some seen some things, heard some things, um, been in meetings at many tables, and you know, find that there are still very strong colonial residues that exist within our, our practices, um, our policies, and our infrastructure. Uh, but I think that's only natural given that, you know, our transformation, you know, didn't pop out of thin air. It is coming from an infrastructure that was a colonial system in the first place, uh, Health Canada, right? Okay. <clears throat> so with that, I uh, will start sharing my screen and then dive into the uh, presentation and hopefully leave us with that plenty of room for conversation. Um, while I am sharing my screen, I, know, I love how everybody has their cameras on, but this is really your time and your learning space. So feel free to turn your cameras off. I won't be able to see you anyway. Um, you know, feel free to stand, stretch. Sometimes I lay down on the floor and relax if I'm listening to somebody and, and uh, watching a presentation. So please do make yourself comfortable. It is Friday afternoon. Um, let's have fun with it, with this learning space here together. And do contribute any comments, reflections, or questions uh, in the chat box. Um, our elders always say, don't be stingy with your teachings. So if you're ever having an aha moment, um, we are taught that you share that aha moment um, because it's gonna validate three other people or four other people in this virtual learning circle. And they're gonna say, oh good, I wasn't the only one that didn't know that. Or I wasn't the only one that had this emotional response to what was just shared. Uh, so I love it as a facilitator, one of my best sense of feedback is when I see the chat box on fire because I know things are resonating with you. I know you're passionate. I know you're learning. I know you're super engaged. It's really hard to do that in a, in a virtual sense because I can't see you. I don't see your head nods. I don't see your smiles. I don't feel your vibrations and your spiritual charges that you have, but I can pick that up in the chat box, um, which I do monitor when, when I facilitate and present. Does that sound okay for folks? Thumbs up, nodding heads. Awesome, all right, okay. Bear with me one second here. I'm just gonna share my screen. Oh, hi, Steven. Good to see you. Okay, decolonizing healthcare systems. I'm just gonna reposition my screen here. And here we go. So um, I would like to start with, uh, by introducing myself a little bit more. And you know, this is what I have been taught by my, uh, my elders, by my family members to really, you know, see who you are and where you kind of come from. And I also exercise this as, as an instructor and a facilitator is to really, you know, who am I, where am I coming from and why the heck should we be listening to Len uh, in the first place. Um, and I really do like to position myself in this work, um, kind of like, you know, when people stand up to speak and they demonstrate all of their years of professional experience and studies and master's degrees and doctorals and all of those kinds of things. Um, I really want to honor and recognize that the information that I am sharing really comes from my cultural privilege of being able to walk into worlds um, by having access to, you know, my traditional teachings, access to my traditional stories and uh, cultural practices, you know, really is a cultural privilege that not a lot of Indigenous people have access to. In that regard, I, I identify as a very rich person, um, that I, I have a, a long uh, lineage to very ancient knowledge, um, uh, knowledge and wisdom and values that I embed into my professional practice. Um, but my professional practice is actually rooted in uh, education. Um, I am by no means a, a clinician. Um, I cut my teeth by becoming a child and youth care worker in the Surrey School District by supporting um, urban Indigenous youth um, from kindergarten to grade 12. And of course, you know, I, I made lots of friends with uh, incredible educators who would give me the, the floor and give me the stage in their classrooms. And then I would talk on and on and on about what it means to be a Coast Salish Keatsy First Nation person um, and talk about the residential schools and uh, weaving cedar baskets and um, hunting and fishing and those kinds of things, traditional medicines. And then teachers were like, oh, Len, you're so good at teaching. You should go back to school to become a teacher. So I did. Uh, I went to UBC's Native Indian Teaching Education Program. Um, I left because I found a passion for uh, communication and public speaking um, out of a course I took at UBC for called Communication for Educators. Um, just loved having what I call mass influence and just standing up and speaking. Um, so that eventually led me to dropping out of UBC's teaching uh, education program. And I went and studied television and radio broadcast in hopes of becoming some indigenous version of Oprah Winfrey uh, for uh, APTN or something like that. Um, and then eventually um, I went back into uh, education because um, my community had asked me to. 
um, and I really kind of missed it. I missed engaging with uh, Indigenous families um, and supporting them in their time of need. Um, and so I use that to mobilize a lot of what I uh, learn in my professional experience. I really kind of land on that as a, as a foundational knowledge base that I use in my professional practice. It's where I learned about, you know, what it means to decolonize, what it means to be culturally safe, what it means to be trauma informed, what it means to be humble and exercise your own humility as a professional when you're working with at-risk youth and their families. Um, uh, that eventually led to my partner, um, Melissa Smith, works uh, as a health director at Kwantlen First Nation. And when I was in education and she was in healthcare, you know, we'd have, you know, dinner, dinner discussions. And I, you know, found this passion uh, for talking about Indigenous health. And back then, I think this is like around 2015 or so, I really enjoyed um, talking about health and wellness. Um, and so I wanted to manifest a career in healthcare. And I'm like, but my background is all in education and uh, child and youth care counseling. I never ever saw an opportunity for working in health, but I really, really wanted it. And then lo and behold, I saw a posting uh, for Indigenous cultural wellness designer at First Nations Health Authority, where um, it, it was a position that was to decolonize and indigenize healthcare curriculum for sexually transmitted and bloodborne uh, infections. And it was health and it was education and it was cultural. And I felt like the creator just pulled it out of the universe and said, here you go, Len. Um, and I applied and I uh, got that uh, position uh, working with the harm reduction team uh, in population and public health, health protection um, uh, in April, 2016. Um, and then, then, of course, that spanned this whole career in, in healthcare talking about decolonization, reconciliation, and indigenization, not just for uh, First Nations Health Authority, but also Fraser Health and um, various other health organizations now across Canada. Um, so that's my background um, and how I show up to this work, how I have learned um, in talking about decolonization. Um, so even though I stand here and, and sit here as a facilitator, I'm first and foremost a learner and a co-learner um, in this work. I really feel like it's active research uh, by engaging in dialogue and conversations just like the one that we're in today. That, you know, you contributing in the chat box, the questions you ask, the stories you share with me contributes to my ability to hold space for our communities about the good work of, of decolonization. So while I hold this knowledge, it is really kind of coming from the stories of, of the, the communities and the people that I have visited over the years. Um, the five protocols that I'd like to emphasize are, uh, are we all familiar with the territory and land acknowledgement as a protocol? Um, so that's one protocol from Coast Salish territory, but did you know that there are five, that the land acknowledgement is just one of five? So the first is beginning with your point of departure. And so I honor and recognize that I am zooming in from my home territory of KC First Nation. Um, we have been here, you know, since the beginning of time. And my peer family, you know, has, has been here since the beginning of time too. Um, no, uh, protocol two is expressing gratitude. So again, I opened with this before I even um, started sharing my slide deck. I would like to reinforce and uh, um, re-say that, you know, I am so humbled and honored um, and holding such a space of, of gratitude and appreciation for each and every one of you uh, for, for answering the invitation. Uh, first of all, for inviting me, but then for you for logging in and, and, and sitting and listening and engaging. Um, I raise my hands to each and every one of you. Um, and then of course, protocol three, I expressed who I am and where I come from, who I belong to. I belong to the Katsi people on my father's side and on my mother's side, I belong to Musqueam First Nation. Uh, protocol four um, is by listening and doing what is asked of you as a Coast Salish protocol. And so, you know, again, I, I reemphasize that while I'm here as a facilitator, I'm first and foremost a learner and a co-learner. And that, you know, often the, the feedback and directives I get from these kinds of engagements, I will incorporate into my professional practice moving forward, doing what is asked of me. And then of course, loving one another. I don't think it is a, no small thing to be able to uh, hold space um, and guide and facilitate this discussion as complex and complicated and sensitive as it is is without doing so with intention, uh, with care, and with love in mind. And you know, I honor and recognize that the work that each and every one of us do, uh, that you do, it's not just hard work, um, it's also heart work. 
And so by us sharing space uh, together today, you know, I do want to do so with an emphasis of care and love at its core. So this is where I invite you to light the chat box on fire. Um, and really just, this is gonna do uh, in adult education, we call this like a knowledge poke. I'm just seeing what do we know so far? And this is a really good chance for, you know, people who've been having this conversation for maybe longer than I have, you know, what, what they know about decolonization. Um, and this also helps us to kind of share what we collectively know and are aware of around the word decolonization too. So I invite you to think about for a moment, what do, what do you know about decolonization? And uh, secondly, what would you like to know? So reflect on that for a moment and then go ahead and just put it into the chat box. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna continue talking while everybody's uh, typing away. Um, but really do um, take, that, take up that vulnerability of putting yourself out there and saying, I don't know. Or of course, you know, those of us who have been a part of this work for some time sharing what we know, uh, what words come to mind? What images, what experiences do you have? Is there a presentation that you heard um, by another Indigenous scholar or Indigenous health leader? Um, what kind of comes to mind? What resonates for you? What hopes do you have about decolonization? Do you have skepticisms about decolonial work? And you know, in the space I hold, because I hold space for a living, I, I built a career out of having complicated, complex conversations. Um, I feel like a theme, uh, sometimes there are uh, themes in my week. And last week there was a theme, or I think it was a couple of weeks ago, where I was feeling like I was getting poked at both ends with skepticism around decolonial work. Um, so people say really nice things to me, like, oh, Len, he's a passionate speaker, he's a passionate educator. Um, but decolonization, you know, we know we'll never kind of get there, right? Um, those kinds of tones and senses that you kind of get from folks when you're very, uh, when you're rooted in activism. Um, and so what I like to think about when it comes to decolonization and for the skeptical folks um, that are out there, maybe some of us are in this room. Um, you know, when we think about criticizing decolonial work, you know, what I like to think about is that decolonization work is intergenerational work. That is decolonization did not happen overnight. So we are not going to decolonize overnight. And the only way that I could be here today is if I did not reflect and appreciate in gratitude what my ancestors and what my elders had done to pave the way for me to be able to and even entertain this discussion on decolonizing healthcare systems. And I am here because of looking back around what ancestors have done before me, what my elders and my parents did for me, and my job, my responsibility as a homo person, a human being today, is to pave the way for the next generation and then the next generation after that. So that's how I think about and address and respond to, you know, uh, critics and, and skepticism around anything cultural safety, anything uh, indigenization and decolonization, because there are skepticisms out there and criticisms around cultural safety uh, work. Um, and I also honor and recognize that that comes from lived experience as well. If I have a very bad experience, then you know what, I'm going to sense that cultural safety is very far away, but I think that we are making leaps and bounds. I'm still very, um, hesitant on uh, the myth of progress, uh, of course, um, because I'm in it. Um, but those are reflections that I offer lightly and with humility. I'm just gonna take a second here to read what folks are sharing. Oh, I love that, both learning and unlearning. Disrupting colonial power systems and patterns, dismantling structures and processes, Heck yes. Committing to change with a humble heart and mind. Absolutely. Unlearning colonizer ways, hierarchy and patriarchy. Oh, love it. Thank you for lighting the chat box on fire. Keep it coming, keep it coming. Okay, I'm going to continue on. So what does it mean to decolonize? Um, for folks who are on social media, I like to throw memes, random memes into my presentations. That's why the cat is there with the question marks. Um, so I think it's important to know that there is no universal definition of decolonization. It really depends on the context in which we are having that discussion. Uh, the, the definition that is under the screen here is lens definition. This is um, what how I personally define definition. And what I would say too is also to create your own definition of what it means to decolonize. Decolonize your professional practice, 
decolonize your your family and relationships, decolonize your um, your policies, decolonize uh, your approaches to the way you do work. Um, because then what we're going to find is we're going to find our own meaning making with the important and good work of decolonization. So Len's definition is a process of dismantling, deconstructing and disrupting of colonial and cultural barriers that separate us, suppress us and often oppress us. So I'm going to guide our conversation in towards more of an institutional level. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it a little bit closer to home and provide an example with decolonizing substance use, which is uh, a curriculum that I've uh, co-written, co-authored uh, for First Nations Health Authority um, that is now uh, offered as a provincial, uh, provincial train the trainer uh, program. So colonial structures in Canada. Oops, I'm going way too fast. Here we go. Colonial structures in Canada, it is important. This is the mirror that we're holding up and really needing to emphasize and, and collaborate, um, disseminating this kind of uh, uh, model and framework uh, into all these other systems that we're kind of up against in Canada. So uh, Canada is a colonial country that is, scaf and is scaffolded um, by these major systems um, that hold up ideology our healthcare system, which we are still a part of as First Nations Health Authority, our education system, our justice system, and of course, our social services system. And because they are founded on colonial ideology, they actively uh, perpetuate very harmful, uh, exclusive um, uh, aspects of our society that often we as Indigenous people are at the forefront of bearing that uh, harm uh, as a result of. So what does that look like? aspects of white supremacy, uh, paternalism, which I've seen Paula uh, put in the chat box, systemic racism, exploitation, uh, and assimilation. So this is really important to know and remember, you know, when we look at in, back in the summer of 2020 and the murder of George Floyd um, and the, the, the marches for Black Lives Matters that were happening in the South, you know, triggered a lot of response here in Canada as well. And you know that also surfaced a lot of stories and cases for what we as Indigenous people have known for far too long is that there is a tremendous amount of police brutality by the RCMP against Indigenous people too. This we know. Um, but then you know what, there's some very brave police officers, chief uh, police officers that came before the news and the media and said, there's no such thing as systemic racism in the RCMP. Little does that police chief know that the RCMP was totally founded uh, and created to forcibly remove Indigenous peoples from the traditional territories and force them onto reserves. After that, the second marching order was to go forth and remove Indigenous children from their families and put them into the Indian residential schools system. So to simply deny that systemic racism exists because we do have colleagues in this healthcare system that do say those kinds of things, we need to nip it in the butt and say, well, no, 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 that conversation isn't even being entertained anymore. It is inarguable. And the In Plain Sight report, of course, you know, really um, uh, uh, shed, that, shed light on that. Um, Capitalism, disease, and when I say disease, I'm really, you know, wanting to emphasize that it, disease do not, does not impact us all in the same way that if we are wealthier and wealthy is, is kind of made by societal design as well, scaffolded by white, white supremacy. Um, and we have, we know this because of redlining and those kinds of things, you know, disease impacts us uh, differently. So when we talk about, you know, how disease is scaffolded uh, through colonization and colonialism, is re I'm really talking about, you know, that we as Indigenous people are overrepresented in the overdose crisis, that we're overrepresented in substance use and addiction, mental health, like um, uh, uh, depression and anxiety. Uh, but then bloodborne infections like hepatitis C and uh, HIV, uh, chronic kidney disease, disease, heart disease, you know, these are conversations that we know. But never ever do we have the opportunity to share with our colleagues um, in, in, the healthcare, in the health authorities that that is scaffolded by colonial systems and our healthcare systems are deeply colonial. And we say things to kind of get around it like diversity, inclusivity, equity, cultural safety now is the new thing, but very rarely do we ever even talk or entertain the idea about colonialism. So part of our work in, in, in decolonial work is inviting everybody to just start using the word decolonization and colonialism and really painting the picture and making those clear linkages between what we are seeing and happening in our communities um, is a direct result of 
mass ideology and of course the colonial systems that, that we work in. Cognitive imperialism, uh, parochial gender violence, destabilization, marginalization, and of course, cultural genocide. Um, there's also a relationship uh, between colonization and institutional oppression in Canada. And I find that this one is, is worth talking about um, as well. Um, and I like to kind of frame this um, by this bird metaphor I learned from a scholar named Marilyn Fry. Um, and she has this metaphor of, of a bird uh, to paint this picture on what institutional oppression looks like. And it really resonated with me because I feel like this is how Canada looks at indigenous peoples from coast to coast to coast. Uh, so if we're Canadians, we're looking at this bird and this bird, let's say, is symbolic and representing Indigenous peoples in Canada. So Canadians can look at this bird and say, oh, it's beautiful, it's so wild, it's so majestic, and it's, it's free. And if it wants, it can just uh, fly away. But, which is a very, more, which is a very micro view of, of the bird, right? Um, so the analogy of the bird in the bird cage is if we kind of went up to the bird cage and just looked through the hole, we're gonna have this unobstructed view of the bird. And that's typically how Canadians really look at us, and including all of our colleagues in healthcare as well. So what we want to encourage folks to do within decolonization work, within cultural safety work, and within reconciliatory work is stop focusing on just this micro view and take a step back and uh, take a more macro view of uh, the systems um, in this country. Because when we kind of step Turks to start to take a step back, we're going to see that there are these bars and that there are these bars and that there are these bars. And then we're going to get a sense very quick and in a hurry that this bird is no longer free, um, that it does not have uh, freedom like you and I, or we, or the rest of society, and that that bird knows that it is not free and it is not likely to fly away. So what does that look like within institutional oppression? It looks like unacknowledged trauma, the institutional cultures that we have. I always say that decolonization culture is uh, quite subtle because it's been replaced and put under this corporate cultural lens is that we often just go with the status quo that, and that status quo usually is a corporate culture that I'll talk a little bit uh, more about uh, a little bit later. Um, an unacknowledged history, um, ideology. And when I say ideology, I'm talking about these really massive widespread beliefs um, that we adopt as, as true in fact. Um, so an example within a, an indigenous context would be, you know, why don't they just get over it, which we've all heard and it pains me to even have it come out of my mouth. Um, but that, uh, that ideology still does exist and has implications for the communities that we serve as well in the institutions that indigenous people work in as well. Um, invisibility, uh, the burden of representation, the reward for conformity. Oh Lord, I just came out of a meeting where we're co-developing an education program for leaders and uh, managers um, that is led by another team. And then of course, I, I oversee the cultural safety team. And we're coming together and we're co-designing this course and they have their agenda that paints in, that, that uh, fits into the greater aspect of the organization. And of course, I have my own agenda for cultural safety. And we kind of came together and we we're kind of just kept on butting heads because they were talking about inclusivity, inclusivity, inclusivity. And I'm coming from, you know, indigenous equity oriented because inclusivity has been around for about 50 years. And I very, you know, very much question what inclusivity has ever done for us as, as indigenous folks. Inclusivity is often weaponized against us and to force to continue to erase us from the conversation. Um, and the same for diversity and equity, I find. So I say that cultural safety does need to be its own, its own bucket uh, with uh, justice and equity and diversity and um, uh, uh, inclusivity. Um, so this uh, reward for conformity, it's kind of like this carrot at the end of the stick that's like, okay, but just come on and just have cultural safety be an add on to this, uh, this leadership design uh, program. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. My new ethic is to be a non-conformist. And I think that's an important aspect to really walk away and think about is how can we be non-conforming in our work? Um, because when we are conforming, we are contributing to the status quo and the status quo is our biggest enemy and driver of harm when we talk about decolonial work. Um, so really 
uh, develop a critical lens or uh, flex your critical muscle for um, recognizing when conformity is happening. And in healthcare, it happens all the time. Why? It's the nature of the system. We have healthcare systems that are designed to respond to the communities around us. So we're a very trauma-oriented uh, organization. Um, and so the reward for conformity is really to fall into that effectiveness over the empathy moving forward. Um, and so my new ethic after that meeting this afternoon, uh, just before coming into this presentation, was to be a non-conformist. And I think I've been very consistent with that um, looking back now. Um, what else do we have here? Isolation, uh, microaggressions, and of course, internalized racism. Um, and then I will unpack each one on the next screen. So unacknowledged trauma, what does that look like? And again, I've been only been doing and teaching and facilitating and holding space for cultural safety for about two years. Um, but it looks like, and I see this all the time, almost on a weekly basis, you know, where we have leaders and managers and just people in the place of power and privilege, when they say things like they don't see color, um, they're colorblind, or we are multicultural. We're a multicultural, every one of our services are um, safe, regardless of your culture. And so I'm always inviting, you know, uh, people in a decolonial and a culturally safe sense to move away from this generalization of what culture means, because what it's doing is it's removing culture from the table for discussion. And we are not culturally blind. Uh, it comes from good intentions, um, I think, that we want to treat everybody the same. And then, of course, I come along and I'm like, no, we don't. We don't treat everybody the same. We do take into consideration people's ability, mobility, age, um, gender, um, and we do take into consideration culture. We're just socially conditioned to uh, avoid talking about culture. Because when people say things like color, being colorblind or multiculturalism or regardless of culture, what it's really doing is not acknowledging the, tra the, the trauma and the traumatic stories that we do have in our past. Um, and so that's what it really looks like when it manifests into the institution. The institutions we serve, um, uh, you know, it's really talking about physical spaces. So the buildings and sites are named after typically, you know, white heterosexual upper class males and not based on indigenous titles that come from the land. Um, so I've noticed in um, the uh, post-secondary institutions have, you know, are really coming along a long ways now where they are talking about uh, transforming their place names, their auditoriums, their lecture halls, their lanes, their ways, their avenues, their streets after Indigenous uh, uh, places, uh, which is a really good step in the right direction. And when I consult for um, health authorities, I, I often say the same thing, that cultural safety is not just, and decolonial work is not just within, you know, um, what we know about our past and what, how we uh, show up to the work. It's also the transformation of our physical spaces. Um, so in starting with building names, because that is a huge part of identity, the building's identity and the team and organization's identity is also a decolonial practice in itself as well. Uh, the reward for conformity um, is really about equality versus equity, uh, which I usually see on, in people, places, and, uh, policies and processes, um, usually in processes as well. Um, so if we look at um, I was consulting for a health organization that was awarding grants to communities and um, had a, ju a ju judiciary member, is that the right word? Um, you know, the people who review all the grants the, and the proposals that come in and openly said, well, the indigenous community gra uh, grants that they submitted were, weren't as strong as the other organizations. So they're not gonna get any funding this year. And I'm like, but it's again, it's that reward for conformity and not and applying that equality lens um, rather than the equity oriented lens as a result of the status quo and the process that has been pre established. Um, but quite often, as organizations, we will lead towards treating everybody the same, too. Um, we really, we want to take a more equity oriented approach. Um, ideology. Um, so often, one I see only because it personally resonates with me um, is, is uh, pathologizing cultural values. You know, as a teacher and a facilitator and a public speaker, um, I talk for a living, but I really, you know, identify as an introvert and people are always shocked to hear that because they're like, oh, you just talk all the time and you're engaging. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I'm, I really identify as an introvert. So at teams and meetings and, and, um, uh, public, um, networking, um, kind of gatherings, I'm actually quite quiet because I'm very observant and that's part of my cultural values, um, as well. 
And then there are colleagues and even friends of mine who are like, oh, what's wrong with you? Or you're so shy or you're so quiet as if there is something wrong with that. Um, but again, I just show that as an example of how corporate culture values, you know, very articulate, very fast responsive, very engaging, very direct. Um, but of course, you know, we know that, you know, when we come from our cultural values as Indigenous peoples that we often list, listen twice as much as we speak. And we hold that in our professional practice too, when we kind of come up through our post-secondary training, and you'll find us to often be the, one of the last ones to speak. But again, we have a corporate culture that's rooted in that very active, responsive, engaging um, uh, dialogue. But we don't want to pathologize people because of their communication styles, because of cultural values. Uh, invisibility, uh, no visual representation of the local First Nations communities on which the site is built, um, the burden of representation. Uh, so this is one I always get, and I don't know how many of you have heard this as well. You know, the Indigenous communities don't engage with us. We keep inviting them, we keep sending them phone calls, and um, they don't show up to our meetings. This is true for community action teams. This is true for primary care networks, for divisions of family practice. And I say, slow it down, be calm, be cool, be patient. And then it's a learning opportunity. It's a learning moment um, because, you know, we are very well-resourced, well-funded health organizations. And our First Nations communities are not, um, uh, or any Indigenous community um, is not as equally funded um, as, as us as major corporations. And so, and because in a time of truth and reconciliation um, and the mandate to engage with uh, indigenous communities um, is, is so paramount now that there are 1000 organizations, you know, busting down the door of the First Nations communities to engage, right? And they're like one person responding to like a hundred different requests. So we need to remember that in our own humility, but be persistent and continuously show up and engage and invite and not give up. Because when the time will come, when they will need your program and your services, they will know exactly where to go. And then they usually find that they're like, oh, okay. But again, that's the reflective of the burden of representation that happens at a systemic kind of level. But then for us as indigenous peoples, and I know I'm preaching to the choir with my uh, brothers and sisters, um, indigenous uh, folks on the line is like, you know, when you're called in to represent your culture or your practice or indigenous ways of knowing and being and doing, you know, often that can be way down heavy on our shoulders sometimes too, if it's just, if people are constantly taking from you because you are the one indigenous person on your team or the one indigenous person in your organization, um, because that has uh, the, in a very spiritual sense, it's almost like people are constantly pulling away from your spirit. And then you wonder why you get home and it's like, I've got nothing left to give. Um, and that's just the, the nature of our organizations too. And, and um, uh, institutional oppression is that burden of representation because we really aren't in a place where we have the, the robust workforce uh, to meet those demands now, uh, not yet. Um, internalized racism, which is, you know, denial of ancestral heritage to gain structural advantage of privilege, microaggressions, um, which looks like, you know, or sounds like, you know, everyone can just succeed if they work hard enough, you know, that meritocracy, or it all, it's all about choice. And that one drives me nuts, because I work in substance use and decolonizing substance use. And then, of course, in conversations way back when we used to have dinner parties in a time before COVID. Um, really not want to engage in conversations about, you know, the overdose crisis and everything because there's so much societal misinformation about, you know, uh, substance use and trauma, grief, loss and daily stress that people will say, well, it's all just about choice. And I'm like, biting my lip. Um, isolation, hiring an Indigenous staff person to take on all Indigenous patients and clients without the social, emotional, cultural and professional supports in place. Um, I still see this one in the education system. Um, and for those of us, you know, who, who know uh, Aboriginal education in the school districts know that there's only one Indigenous staff person per school probably to take on the entire caseload of the Indigenous students who probably have the most diverse needs and requirements um, to have a well-rounded education program. Uh, so again, that Indigenous staff person, and I know that because that's where I cut my teeth is in the Surrey School District, um, a tremendous sense of isolation. Number one, because you're the only one in the school who holds that job title as Aboriginal support worker or Aboriginal youth care worker or cultural worker. Um, so you don't necessarily have your own circle of practice or your comrades to kind of lean into and tap into to support you in that good work. Um, and then of course we can, that's where we encounter burnout um, as well. And I have conversation with the school districts in two weeks uh, to talk about that. 
So when it comes to shifting, you know, so that's that's the problem. That's the issue. That's the corporate culture that we kind of show up in. So what is the way forward and how can we start to shift lenses for a decolonial approach? Um, I like to say and take the approach of shifting our values. Um, and this is where I say too, it's, it's um, developing a, a lens and a perception to really pick up corporate values that are really supporting and scaffolding that colonial ideology that we see. And when you see it, having the courage and the bravery to speak up and say, I think we're having a colonial moment here. Maybe we should pause and, and um, uh, reflect on this a bit. Maybe we need to bring somebody in. Maybe we need to involve somebody else. Um, because again, our healthcare system is, and this is total corporate culture, um, is that we're, we operate in a system that's driven by ideas and actions. Only it doesn't happen that slow. It's like ideas and actions, ideas and actions, ideas and actions, ideas and actions. Um, and that doesn't create the safest ecosystem for good team-based care to have a good effective team and to have a decolonial approach. Um, it's also a terrible system for cultural safety to exist because when you're just driven in uh, ideas and actions, ideas and actions, ideas and actions, there's no room for you to be creative. And if we can't be creative with one another, we can't lean into systemic transformation. So what we need to do is inject a pause into uh, our ideas and actions and really want to center some indigenous values. Um, Non-indigenous people ask me all the time, well, Lynn, I want to take a decolonial approach, but I don't want to appropriate, you know, indigenous cultures. I'm like, well, that's a really good response. That's a really good reflection and a really good concern to have in your back pocket. Don't lose sight of that. But, you know, we don't need to appropriate indigenous cultures and indigenous methodologies to decolonize. All it takes really at the essence and at its core is a shift in values. So our current corporal values, and this we know because we live, eat, and breathe this um, with all of our de deadlines and papers and timelines that we need to meet, you know, we're uh, operating a system that is driven by competition, science, literacy, one reality, time is linear, uh, the tremendous sense of uh, a hierarchy and a trickle-down effect, bureaucratic authority, cognitive imperialism, and success by material gain. So wherever we're sensing that colonial moment, so when we're in our team meetings and we're sensing that uh, ideas and actions, ideas and actions, and we're kind of sensing the sense of competition or time is linear, or this is a hierarchical moment, we just say, hey, I think this is a colonial moment. Let's hit the pause here and really um, put the lens under uh, indigenous values. Um, so instead of competition, how can we emphasize cooperation? Uh, make room for spirituality and orality over literacy. Uh, multiple realities and seeing multiple realities as valid um, and useful um, over just the one singular reality. Time is cyclical, a submission to duty rather than a hierarchy, um, relational authority instead of a bureaucratic authority, uh, non-interference instead of cognitive imperialism, and success by relationships instead of success by material gain. Um, so decolonial practices within a healthcare kind of context, I find to be um, around some common themes, at least in my own research um, regarding uh, healthcare and education, because I, those are kind of the two worlds in which I walk, but these are some of the themes that constantly um, keep emerging in my conversations, in my own research, um, in, in my um, uh, schooling that I'm doing. And it really comes from, you know, moving away from non-pathologizing language and I have examples of this that I will use in um, decolonizing substance use. Um, really operating and grounding yourself in a resiliency framework. And I know FNHA does very good at this at a corporate and, and uh, institutional uh, kind of level. If we just look at our vision and mission and values um, is all kind of addressing this decolonial um, framework. Um, indigenous knowledge, indigenous healing, holistic sense of healing, which I love our, and always use our FNHA um, wellness wheel, uh, community oriented, focused on interconnection, and of course our relationship and connection to land. So there's decolonizing um, substance use, which I will show just as a model, as a story that where um, decolonial work can have a possibility. 
And so uh, uh, before I share that, I'm just gonna pause for a moment and just open up the floor because I see the chat box. There's so much uh, good knowledge and teachings being shared in, in the chat box. I just wanna pause to really open up the floor in the space for uh, people who have stories to share, people who have questions on their mind. And of course, for uh, 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 relatives and colleagues who, who have some teachings of their own that they would like to share um, with, with uh, the conversation so far. So I'm just gonna stop sharing and just pause for a second and open up the floor. I'm also using this time to catch up on what folks were putting in the chat box too, so. Oh, wow. I love this conversation in the chat box. That's why nobody's talking right now. Everybody put it in there. Indigenous equity lens. Yes. Yes, that's a big one. Um, where did it go, Jody? Being hired as Indigenous specific role and having to follow the same policies, the same protocols and rules as everyone else. So not being able to do the job in a way that will better need, meet the needs of people. Absolutely. It's kind of like that real superficial, real conform, conforming kind of moment. Uh, very, um, I hate the word and I never really use the word, but I want a very tokenized approach to um, when organizations and teams take on that, well, we're indigenizing or we're decolonizing because we have this indigenous person in this indigenous role and they have to do the exact same kind of thing, which is that moment that I was having in that meeting when <laughs> trying to co-create a course. Uh, with, with this leadership team and it's their job to develop the whole program. I just have this little chapter to talk about cultural safety and I'm like, it's not floating my boat. <laughs> and I don't think they liked it and I didn't like it either. Um, but I'm, I, again, I'm persistent and transparent in that. So I think they respected it and I think I'll, I'll get it. Any thoughts, feelings, aha moments that people wanna share? Hi, Len, it's Paula. Yes, Paula, hi Paula. I have a uh, comment to make um, about decolonizing our practice practice within healthcare. Uh, just to give you a little bit summary, we uh, some of us from the collaborative practice we put together a call to action anti-indigenous uh, racism letter. And at our uh, meetings that we're having, how we're going to go about this to bring it to the bigger collaborative practice team. Um, there's all these tasks that were coming about. And I sat and I listened to everybody and how that was gonna roll out, but I actually wanted to bring in ceremony of this letter because these are great ideas. These are transforming ideas and to actually um, have it uh, recognized by our ancestors and um, to make it start in a good way, we need to have ceremony first and then will work from there, from that letter of recommendations for anti-racism. So that's just an example of decolonizing our practice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what, what you're reminding me of, uh, that I'm continuously reminding myself of, of, Paula, is that, you know, decolonial work is also a practice. Uh, it's not perfection. Um, and I constantly get sucked into the vacuum that is the corporate world, the, the status quo. Um, and I think that it's really hard for us to do that when we are uh, in roles and responsibilities that have such a tremendous need for us to do this work. So we show up to work, we're passionate about the work that we need to do. We want to lean into transformation. We want to build the better systems, better services, better delivery uh, platforms. We're very passionate about it. And what happens is we want to be super effective. And so again, like in my own professional practice, and you know, I show up to meetings and it's like, okay, we have the agenda, we have the, the framework, we have the outline, we have the processes, and get, I, get, I get sucked into that corporate vacuum of, of doing business. And then very occasionally, you know, I will have that dawning moment where I'm like, okay, you know what, let's just okay, put everything aside, put everything down, and let's be. Um, and let's let's zip it and, and listen to uh, knowledge keepers. Let's listen to elders. Let's partake in ceremony. That is learning. That is the process too, and even better process too. 
Um, but I would offer that as a pitfall to be mindful of moving forward in decolonial um, journeys is, is to be mindful of the vacuum because it is a vacuum. We get sucked up into it and lose ourselves in it all the time. Um, but then I say too, it also requires a degree of patience to be patient with yourself that it's a practice, not perfection. Um, in fact, it's, it's a little bit messy um, and we need to be okay with that, that, that messiness. Um, and you know, for those of us who are new to decol decolonization as a concept, as a work, as a framework, um, to really um, not be afraid of, of rolling our sleeves up and just getting in there. Because um, if we were in community, you know, you just we just throw you in it anyway. Um, because if we're afraid of of um, you know causing harm, or or we're afraid of not having the right moment, the right moment will never present itself. Um, but we just need, as a team, as an organization, as a family, um, you know, need to center our ethics about us, um, so that you know when it does get messy, we have some good collective ethics that that we can share. That I learned from uh, Vicky Reynolds. Hi, Len, Leona. Hi, Leona. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm always, I'm always happy to see your name in your face. Um, really good presentation. Thank you so much. I'm sitting here beating. Well, it's my new thing is I bead while I'm <laughs> beating because then I can actually listen. But, you know, there's a lot of so many things I could talk about. But, you know, the I do really want to talk, talk about out decolonization because I sit on an Indigenous Nurses Council that was just started for uh, a university that is Christian based. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting. How's this going to go? <laughs> One thing about Indigenous peoples, we're very, have a lot of really good sense of humor. I don't know that people get that, but that's <laughs> how I am anyway. And, you know, going through the tour, the terms of reference, which is, you know, it's a, it's a structure, it's a framework, it's colonial, it's a, it's a procedure, policy or whatever. I suggested putting in decolonization in there. And everybody was for it because there's non-Indigenous people on this council as well. And there was actually, there's actually a, a very well-respected elder and Indigenous scholar who did not want that word on there. And I'm like, oh, geez. Oh my God. <laughs> and you can see everybody's face on the Zoom and they're like, oh, how do we say this? So I just was like, you know, I'm gonna go out of my comfort zone and respectfully say that this is something I, I firmly believe we need to have in this work, especially when we're educating nursing students and future nurses about what this is gonna, this is gonna look like in healthcare, because I'm still trying to understand what decolonization means and it's still a process for me. Um, but that was really uncomfortable for me because I, like you, I'm actually pretty introverted, but I don't think many of my colleagues on here would believe that. Uh, and I just, yeah, I, that really resonated with me about that, just whole presentation, obviously, and trying to be vulnerable. I think people are scared to be vulnerable and really put that, what they're feeling and that uncomfortableness about, I'm not racist, I'm not biased, I don't discriminate, but we're human beings. There is no way that anyone can not do those behaviors. We're, we're all raised that way. I do that kind of behavior, guaranteed. How to, you know, it's about unlearning and, you know, just be kind to everybody. Like you said on the fifth one, be loving. That's all people want is to be loved. Well, at least 99% of the population, maybe somebody doesn't, but you know, that's a basic human tenant of life. Yeah, that really resonates and hits close to home for me is, is um, cause I always, I'm a nerd for words um, and, and really do believe in the power of words to transform because words shape our thoughts and our thoughts shape our beliefs and our beliefs, you know, inform how we are going to treat one another. And I, I've only been using the term decolonization since, you know, probably I, when I first started with First Nations Health Authority by developing, you know, curriculum for harm reduction and um, decolonizing substance use, which I, I will share in a few minutes. 
Um, but I think that uh, even in my own community, I, as soon as I really started resonating with it and developing, forming a relationship to the word and the work, I started to almost look like I was obsessed with decolonization because I'm like, we can decolonize this, we can decolonize this. I would show up to our general bad meetings and I swear to God, my chief and counselor were like, oh God, there's Len again. He's going to say we can decolonize this and decolonize that. So I was almost like an accidental activist <laughs> for decolonial work. Um, and then and it's funny because I was the only person in my community who I saw publicly uh, attending, you know, our community meetings all the time. And then all of a sudden you see elders start using decolonial, like uh, maybe we should decolonize this, this plan or this, this community engagement process that this organization wants to do with us. And I'm like, the elders are picking up, the youth were picking it up. And, and so I do feel like it's new and totally recognize that, you know, what, um, uh, it is a relationship. Um, cause we have, you know, relationships that are uncomfortable with certain words and, and languages. Um, I had an executive who said, um, that, uh, the health systems weren't ready to talk about decolonization. So I should probably not do it. Um, and I'm like, again, not, I'm not I'm such a nonconformist. I'm like, well, watch me then. <laughs> um, and I love it because there are, that's where we find, uh, like-minded, like-hearted individuals too, is when we kind of start singing our own songs and then like-minded, like-hearted individuals will kind of find their way to you. And then we build communities and then communities, you know, really will, will establish transformation. Any other stories or teachings? I know there's so much, I'm looking at like so many of, of folks in here who have been also doing this work for a long time, I'm like, Anything that people want to share, ideas or strategies? I will share something personal. And I, I shared this on a much smaller meeting last week. Um, and I did it as a, a sales pitch in my educator pathway yesterday. Very personal. Um, you know, I'm half Chinese and I'm half First Nations. Uh, I've always identified as First Nations because that's how I was raised with my First Nations family. My daughter looks exactly like me, exactly. She's my mini me, except she's like five inches shorter than me. So like literally my mini me. <laughs> and you know, with everything that's been happening in the news uh, with racism, anti-Asian racism and indigenous racism, we were talking and she goes, you know, mom, because my grandson is, does not look like us. He, he, look, he, he looks white, blonde haired, blue eyed. She said, you know, mom, I'm really glad Caden doesn't look like us because he's not going to have to face the same issues that we face. How sad is that? That she's so worried about her son, my grandson, having to face the issues that we have been raised with that we've had to live through and still live through. She's saying to me, I'm, you know, I don't want him to have to go through that too. That's the reality, like, this is the real, the real deal. This is the real stuff. And I just don't know how, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I, I pe people need to hear about because I'm proud to be who I am. I'm proud to be Leona and I'm proud of my cult, both my cultures. Um, and I just, yeah. You know, honestly, even when I'm out with my grandson, because I ha I, we spent, he's the light of my life and we spend a lot of time together. He's in my bubble. In the back of my head, I'm thinking, I wonder if they think I'm actually related to him or if I'm his nanny. And I'll, I'll be the first one to say that. Like, because my daughter's father was very blonde haired and blue eyed. He was from Ireland, um, right from Ireland. And you know, when my daughter was with her dad, they never thought she was his daughter. So it's all those, those implicit, those, in, those biases and impressions that I ask people to really examine and think about when you look at somebody, because you don't even know when you're talking to a First Nations person just because they don't look at it or any other culture, but I, and specifically First Nations people, because this is what this is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so important and so heartbreaking, right? And it's like such a, and I really do feel like um, 
you know, and this is what I also call and, and make direct linkages to when I, I teach cultural safety and humility at Fraser Health. Um, I say that it's, it's a Canadian socialization, um, that we pride ourselves in being such a, you know, a multicultural and kind and respective country for, you know, which we are for the large part. Um, but, you know, really, you know, uh, was coming from this colonial I, I, ideal that, that uh, we don't talk about race and culture. Pride ourselves in being multicultural, but never did we ever get an opportunity to talk about race, racism, and, and different cultures. And so what we do is we have an entire society that is conditioned and, and trained and, and uh, socialized to not, to not engage. Um, so then that's like the hardest part in talking about race and racism and decolonization is that we haven't even been in a place to, to formulate a relationship with it. So we, I always say we have a low resilience as, as uh, professionals um, to have those complicated and complex conversations about race and racism and decolonization for that matter. Um, so when we put decolonization on the table for discussion quite often, it's like, ooh, that's for the indigenous folks. I'm like, no, 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 get back here. This involves you too, because um, this is for everybody, right? Um, and I think that, you know, um, the conversations over the last couple of years, at least, that, you know, we're, we're uh, engaging a lot more, at least. And I don't know if that's because I'm involved in the work and, like, and just having that experience of uh, having conversations or that, or that society is ready to have conversations now. Um, I'm not sure. Um, there was a question in the chat box about the relationship or the difference between uh, decolonize and indigenize. Sorry, just one sec. I have a little bit of a distraction here. This cat is playing behind my computer. I'm afraid he's going to unplug it. Um, um, that's a really good question. And again, I'm still figuring out how I that how I'm building a relationship to the word indigenize. Um, I thought I had it figured it out, figured out years ago when I when I first started this learning journey. Um, I understood indigenize as um, like a, a, a an act of re reclamation. Um, so when it is indigenous owned um, and, and operated with indigenous knowledge and values at its core, um, is to indigenize something. Um, so way back when I co-authored uh, co decolonizing substance use with my friend and colleague Andrea Medley. Um, we had decolonizing substance use, and then we had indigenizing harm reduction. And then one of our elders taught us in community, she's like, you keep saying indigenizing. I don't know, understand this word indigenize. She's like, it's either ours or it's not. So call it indigenous or, or not. <laughs> um, so then I just started calling it indigenous harm reduction principles and practices because they were ours. They were our principles. They were philosophies for how we do harm reduction. Um, so I do look at indigenization as a transformation to put indigenous people in, in the uh, places of power and, and authority um, for how or an organization or a team will work. And then of course with indigenous knowledge and values at its core. So to me indigenization is a lot farther down the line or down the spectrum of progress uh, colonial uh, to decolonize. I think step one is decolonization, um, which is dismantling, disrupting, uh, deconstructing colonial uh, ideas and actions. Um, the next step would be to indigenize. Um, so we can indigenize, you know, different things. Like we can indigenize um, schools. Um, we can indigenize uh, teams and, and smaller organizations. Large ones are really, really, I think are much farther down. Um, um, but that's what I think about uh, the relationship between decolonization and indigenization. There was this um, initiative in um, uh, institutions of higher learning, post-secondary institutions were mandated to take on decolonization and indigenization, which they are. And then uh, the community was really skeptical on indigenization and in that it really wasn't going to be achievable unless your board of directors, your board of governors, your, um, your, your council, your president, your vice, and your provost were all indigenous peoples. And then all of your curriculum would be indigenous knowledge and values and rooted in indigenous uh, 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 pedagogy. That would be true indigenization of the academy, but which is not really achievable. Like we can't 100% we can't indigenize UBC today, um, but maybe in the future. 
Um, but we can take aspects of, of um, scaling how we can decolonize it's, it's, it as an institution. We can decolonize its curriculum pieces, its approaches, its practices, its policies, its physical spaces. But uh, I look at indigenization as a progression after the work of decolonization. Does anybody have any other ideas or, or uh, thoughts they want to share on indigenization before I move on? Okay, moving on. Thank you for that, everybody. I'm just gonna share my screen again and then just share the example of decolonizing substance use. So here's an example of what decolonization can look like um, in action. So, you know, there was a purpose, there was a, a problem that we had that we needed to take a more decolonial approach. Well, what was the problem? What was the issue? Well, if you think about, you know, probably your own learning um, back when you're growing up as a youth or a young adult, what was your drug education? Uh, what did your drug education look like? Or, you know, just thinking about, you know, family dinner conversations or what you saw in the news and the media when, you know, there was active substance use that was happening. Um, there was a culture uh, within professional practice and its society that really uh, acted as barriers for implementing good work. And that good work was harm reduction. And we wanted to implement harm reduction in First Nations communities when the overdose uh, crisis was declared in April 2016. However, you know, when we would go into uh, First Nations communities to talk about naloxone, um, we would, and naloxone is, you know, how to reverse an overdose. And we would go into communities and start talking about how to reverse an overdose uh, from a, a, an opioid overdose. Uh, response. And we would talk about the drugs people were using, where people were using them, and who was most at risk, because that's part of the naloxone training. And so we put that on the table for discussion, and all of a sudden, all these red flags would go up, and community members would be very concerned and have very um, uh, important questions that needed to be addressed really early on before we can even get into the naloxone training. Um, and it was all kind of rooted in this collective community-oriented culture that is not just specific to First Nations people, but broader society as well, um, where we stigmatize people who use substances, or we over-pathologize them, uh, we don't look at their tremendous social pain, uh, no acknowledgement of, of trauma that was really deficit-oriented um, and really painted under this good-bad binary. If you're abstinent, you're great, and you're uh, on the red road, um, and then the, the bad, that if you were using substances, well, then you were bad and you were a bad person if you were actively using substances. Um, so as a result, you know, in, at the community level, we would often, and it, at the family level, would use rather dehumanizing um, language uh, about people who are using substances, even if they're our own relatives. And I still see this on my Facebook chat all the time with my own relatives and, and in, in different nations, where we say dehumanizing language against our own peoples who are actively using substances um, and see them as inferior. Um, and then of course, people who were using um, substances recreationally, you know, often did so, you know, um, in hiding or in secret. Um, so we really lacked a societal awareness. Uh, we lacked the context for why we as indigenous people were overrepresented in substance use. And of course, we just needed to address the vast amount of misinformation was out there. So I put this red brick wall up against um, as, as a kind of like this image that kind of came to mind when we started this work uh, way back at the early stages of the overdose crisis, that it was almost impossible to get around this, this wall um, to, to talk about caring for people who are using substances because there was all this colonial ideology that existed at the community level. Um, so, cause we would go in and we're like, okay, let's talk about reversing an overdose. And they're like, okay, well maybe we shouldn't do naloxone training because if we do naloxone training, then that's just gonna encourage everybody to overdose. Um, which causes so much more harm and puts so many uh, community members uh, at risk of, of overdose and death. Uh, so what we needed to do is we needed to bust down this wall, this colonial barrier. Again, going back to my definition of decolonization is, is dismantling, disrupting, deconstructing colonial cultural barriers. That is represented by this brick wall. We could not get in to do harm reduction and, and save lives and improve the quality of life for people who are using substances with these colonial walls that existed within the community. So that's where decolonization of substance use really kind of was born from. And for a little bit of a, a knowledge credit, you know, the, the curriculum for decolonizing substance use, I also call it DSU, 
um, is co-authored by my, my, myself and, and my friend and colleague, uh, Andrea Medley, um, and really uh, written by and for and with um, uh, over a hundred First Nations communities across uh, the province. You know, we would go into communities and we had this idea about decolonizing substance use as a concept. And then what happened is we opened up this, this moment, this window uh, of a safe time and space where people uh, leaned into the conversation. And they said, yeah, uh, I when I think about decolonizing substance use, I think about, you know, the language that we use. Um, it doesn't feel good to, you know, say the things that we say about some of our loved ones who are actively using substances. Um, so really what I'm sharing with you is just a collection of stories over time that have created this, this, this curriculum. Um, Andrea and I just organized it um, into, into it, its curricular framework. Um, when it comes to substance use and addiction, a big part of decolonizing substance use is being incredibly intentional with the language that we use. Again, moving away from that stigmatizing language, but also moving away from the pathologizing of language. And this is an important one to remember and consider when we are working in healthcare, because we use pathologizing language because it's the status quo, but it's also our professional framework that we operate in. Um, and in particular, you know, mental health and substance use. Um, so when we're being intentional about the, the language that we're using, this curriculum piece used to be called decolonizing addiction. And it was very early on in the overdose crisis in working with uh, peers and people with lived experience that told us early on, hey, Len, you know, um, decolonizing addiction is great, but not all people who are using substances are addicted. And, you know, the vast majority of people who are, are using substances aren't even addicted. Um, and so it was important to highlight that was a, a big learning part for myself. You know, more than 90% of people who use illegal drugs don't even meet the criteria uh, for problematic behavior, behaviors associated with substance use. But we as a society obsess over the very small percentage who are affiliated with criminal activity. And the news and the media really perpetuate that uh, idea because anytime you see news coverage about the overdose crisis, it shows images of, of uh, downtown East Vancouver. Um, so people with addiction are not the only people at risk of harm and overdose. So we use substance use now, so that's why it's called decolonizing substance use, to be more inclusive um, uh, to people who are using substances. And it's also worth noting and being mindful that we hear things like uh, substance misuse, substance abuse, and substance use disorder, which are pathologizing language pieces. And we have, and in, in our Not Just Naloxone program at the, within our Four Directions Wellness Team program, uh, invite community members to move away from using that. They have their time, they have their space. If you're a clinician and you're working in that, that's great. But at the community level, we don't want to kind of give uh, our own families permission to be using pathologizing language when that's not really our space. And this work and this topic matters most uh, to the people uh, who are actively using substances. Um, because who am I as, as a non-clinician, I'm not a doctor, who am I to say that, you know, my, commu my fellow community members, uh, substance use is problematic, that it is misuse, that it is abuse. Um, and so now I hear it all the time. I hear it in movies that I watch. I, I, I hear it in, in television uh, and, and uh, news stations, news stories coverages, where they're always saying substance abuse, substance misuse, and substance use disorder. Again, they have their time and place, but at a community level and within a non-pathologizing way, a decolonial way, it's just saying substance use um, to be inclusive. So why decolonize substance use? Um, as adult learners, we need to know why. Why are we here? Why are we having this conversation? And so we'd like to share this at the community level too, and say that really it's about creating a collective understanding about sensitive and complex topics, such as talking about drugs. Um, number two, to make clear linkages between colonialism, trauma, and substance use. Number three, to remove the blame from people who have experienced trauma. And number four, to respectfully balance the tone of the conversation and move forward in a good way. Because when we would show up to talk about naloxone and reversing overdoses, you know, everyone was coming at this, uh, to this very important conversation with different thoughts, different feelings, different experiences. Sometimes those feelings were uh, uh, quite strong, strong emotions like anger, resentment, guilt, or shame uh, because they have their own lived experience or because they are actively caring for a family member who is in active substance use. So they were walking around with all of this shame and all of this um, discomfort of not knowing enough. 
So we had to put everybody on the same page before moving forward. So that was our pause. Rather than getting right into the naloxone training, we, that idea and action, idea and action, idea and action, we had to inject the pause. And that was decolonizing substance use to put us all on the same page. Um, so the first aspect or component, I will say, the first stop in decolonizing substance use is addressing misinformation, no, not addressing misinformation, um, is um, broadening the context. Why are we as uh, Indigenous peoples overrepresented in substance use, addiction, and over the overdose crisis? Um, uh, and really to remove the blame from people too, um, because we know that people you know, grandmothers and aunties and moms would always ask us, you know, why do my relatives continue to use substances if they know there's a risk of an overdose? It just doesn't make sense in my mind. It's like playing uh, with your life, gambling with your life. Or they would say things like, why do my loved ones continue to use substances if they know it's hurting me and it's hurting my family? So we had to address the why and that missing context for why we're overrepresented as Indigenous peoples. So we highlight colonialism as one of the root causes of addiction. And we highlight three colonial events. And as Indigenous peoples, you know, we know that we have endured many, many, many colonial events and continue to endure colonial events. Uh, but for the purpose of this exercise, we've highlighted these three, the residential schools, the 60 scoop and land theft. And from every colonial event, there'll be certain residues that are left behind in the community as a result. So for example, above uh, residential schools, you will see there that there's a tremendous sense of fear and a tremendous sense of shame and usually that is towards, you know, places of authority, like people of authority, like the RCMP or the principals um, or your doctor for that matter, um, and institutions, um, which is why we know, you know, family members of ours who are indigenous and have, may have come from not so good experiences will be on their deathbed before they even want to walk into an emergency room or see a doctor. A sense of isolation, a sense of learned helplessness, and from the 60s scoop, a sense of detachment, loss of identity and loss of rights. And from land theft, uh, poverty, lack of housing and loss of freedom. And if we were to pool all those together and give them a theme, what would we call them? Well, we call them trauma, grief, loss and drivers and contributors to one's daily stress. And then when we're doing this activity in community for decolonizing substance use and addiction, uh, we pose the question to the community members that are present and we say, well, do we meet and do we agree that trauma, grief, loss, and daily stress um, can drive and reinforce one's relationship with addiction? And then you see everybody kind of like unanimously, unanimously nodding their head in an agreement. Like, yeah, I get it. When you, when you paint it that way and you make those linkages very clear, it's almost inarguable that, you know, we use addiction. We don't choose to be addicted. We use addiction to feel good about all of the bad shit that's on the screen here. Um, and so right away, we start to remove the blame from people who are using substances. And this has been quite a transformational moment that we have seen in community where loved ones feel like they, um, it makes sense for um, why somebody might be using substances or in a relationship with addiction in their family or within their community because of coming from this connection. Because this is our truth. This is our reality. This is very intimate experiences that are part of our not so distant history. Um, it's very tangible in our mind, in our emotions. And so when we make that clear distinction between the relationship between uh, colonialism, trauma, and, and substance use and addiction, um, it really lands home for a lot of folks. And then of course, we like to broaden our social perceptions on what uh, addiction can look like and manifest as well by brainstorming um, socially acceptable or hidden forms of addiction, which you see on the, the two sides of the, uh, the side of addiction, the word addiction on the top. Uh, so alcohol, pain, gambling, and sex can all be manifestations of one's relationship with addiction. Exercise, food, work, coffee, and uh, phone and technology can also be for um, manifestations of one's relationship with addiction. And the reason we like to do that is, you know, to really move away from the othering of people who are actively using substances, which is a colonial uh, idea and a colonial value is the othering of people. Um, because when we put addiction on the table for discussion, we were like, that's not me. I don't do drugs. I'm abstinent. I played around when I was a kid. I'm now clean and sober, which I don't invite people to use the words clean and sober. Um, so what we needed to do, which is further stigmatizing. So we needed to bring it a little bit closer to home. 
And we do that by brainstorming those socially acceptable forms of addiction, because I might not be in a relationship with drugs, but I might be in a relationship with being a shopaholic. Or um, I discovered Amazon like a couple of months ago and it, it's, it's a thing. Um, or uh, I might be in a relationship with um, becoming a workaholic. Um, so there I'm like, and I might be using my work to cope with my own stress. Maybe the stress is at home. Maybe it's with my partner or my marriage or my children. And I am diving into work because I, I, I'm coping with the stress. Or maybe I am uh, a shopaholic uh, and, and addicted to shopping and purchasing um, because I have lost somebody or lost someone. And I'm trying to fill that hole in, in myself with some things, things that I can purchase or buy. Um, and so that kind of brings it a little bit closer to home so that we start to see, yeah, I am in a relationship. This is also a part of my story and may still, might still be a little bit of my story too. So broadening our social percep perception to be less stigmatizing about uh, substance use and people who are actively using substances. Two things that we'd like to highlight within this uh, uh, concept map called the roots of addiction um, is where do our attitudes about addiction come from and how might these attitudes inform how we treat people within our own communities. So where do our attitudes about addiction come from? Uh, when the overdose crisis was declared in April 2016, um, you know, once upon a time we had all 203 felt like uh, First Nations communities um, just really deeply rooted and emphasized this abstinence only culture. Uh, just say no, don't do it, just quit. And I wondered why that was, because you know we pride ourselves in being uh, distinct and different from one another. But all of us, all of our communities were just abstinence only um, based messaging and programming. And in asking myself, you know, why is that? Where does this come from? Why is it so profound um, in every single community? Uh, if we come down the left side of the map here, we're gonna land on the residential schools. And who ran the residential schools? Religious churches. And religion is all about abstinence only. Just say no, don't do it, just quit. And then what was shared with me by a young matriarch, uh, a young uh, woman um, who was, I think, 20 years old and an elected member of council uh, off the coast of uh, Prince Rupert, uh, we were doing this on a flip chart and brainstorming this together. And she said to me, she's like, well, Len, you know, if we're just, uh, as leadership, if we're just um, recycling and regurgitating uh, colonial ideas like abstinence only with as, as our only value, then what we're really doing is just recolonizing ourselves. And I was like, mind blown. I was like, yes, absolutely. And that is the process for decolonial work is to see the sometimes status quo that we have inherited from the residential schools. It becomes the cycle and we, we, we just recycle it, regurgitate it, meaning that I have parents who have brought me up in a culture to demonize uh, drugs but without acknowledging our historical trauma, come across drugs and find that it helps me cope with my trauma, grief, loss, and daily stress. And then I might use recre re recreationally, medicinally, or in a relationship with addiction, and then become further stigmatized in the community. And then we continuously do this within our own communities and further stigmatize and demonize people who are using substances. So decolonizing substance use was meant to disrupt that uh, cyclical process to inject new information like indigenous harm reduction principles and practices. Secondly, what we'd like to point out um, in the roots of addiction uh, is how might this reflect on how we treat addictions in our communities um, at the community level. And this is not just, in, I know this is painted within an indigenous uh, context. This is also what we see across the world when we're talking about addiction and working with addiction. That when I have loved ones that I love and care for so much, who are in a relationship with addiction or substance use. Uh, I love and care for them so much, I wanna motivate them to thinking something different so that they make a different lifestyle decision or behavior. But quite often, what are our go-to go -to motivators at the community level? We try to either fear them out of their substance use or we'll try to shame them out of their substance use. But if we're using fear and shame as a motivator, what we're really doing is contributing to the trauma, grief, loss, and daily stress that's contributing to the addiction. Or sometimes um, communities, um, meaning health centers, um, will have known families or known households who are in active substance use or active addiction or selling drugs in the community and will cut off, uh, detach from them from the healthcare services uh, and, and isolate them 
But if we're detaching and using detachment as a motivator to pick up your act or you know what have you, um, we're again contributing to the trauma, grief, loss, and daily stress that's contributing to the addiction. Um, again, I know that you know I wanted to prepare you at the very beginning that you know our conversation was going to get a little bit rocky and emotional. I want to honor and recognize that the words that are represented on this screen uh, don't instill a lot of good feelings for each and every one of us. Uh, but this is the, the nature and reality in which we are working in as a health authority um, and as a program in our work in decolonization. My promise to you is that I wouldn't leave you there. Uh, I always want to end on a note that's uh, hopeful and healing and inspirational. And so a transitional quote that, that we use in NJN is um, by Dr. Bruce Alexander, who says that the uh, opposite of addiction is not abstinence. The opposite of addiction is connection that when we have healthy joys and bonds uh, in our lives, then we are more in a place, in a position to be able to, you know, um, not necessarily need or require or want uh, to use substances um, to fill that. Um, so what's the opposite of colon <laughs> colonialism is our sense of community. And what are the things that we want to recenter, restore and revitalize is a sense of family and friends, culture and tradition and nationhood and territory. So when I say family and friends, I don't mean necessarily our blood quantum uh, family, uh, because let's be honest, not every family is necessarily a good company that you want to keep around, um, nor are our families always the safest. Um, and I say that lightly and with humility, but I think it's just important to, to, to say, you know, it's, it's important to know in the context of talking about, you know, uh, health and wellness um, within a First Nations context. When I say family and friends, I mean the ones who you surround yourself that you know love and care for you and you love and care for in return. Um, for, and what are the things that we want to, those residues that we want to reinstill in communities, a sense of love and inclusion and a sense of purpose. Um, and from culture and tradition, we want to instill a sense of identity and, and personal power, uh, knowing what I can and cannot do in this crazy, fast developing modern world uh, and a sense of attachment. And from nationhood and territory, we want to recenter, restore and revitalize stability, relationships and autonomy at a community level. Um, and if we were to pull all those together, you know, that gives us a new theme of healing, joy, bonding, and peace, which will give us uh, a greater sense of, of connection. And again, connection looks different for each and every one of us. Um, and what does connection look like? It can look like safety, um, being a place to, having a place to be loved and provide love, a uh, place where you can exercise your own creativity, empower others, receive empowerment to contribute. Um, when I first started my career working in the elementary school system. I was a child and youth care counselor for Indigenous kids at an inner city school in Surrey. And I remember there was a young student who was in kindergarten and uh, he had a, a, in kindergarten already, a rather large case file, um, came from, you know, some trauma and came from poverty. They were homeless at the time and um, he didn't have very much. Um, this tiny little uh, Indigenous uh, First Nations boy, I, I think came from up north, and um, walking into his kindergarten classroom to to support him and check in on him and, and develop a, a relationship, a working relationship with him, he was the most uh, generous, uh, contributing, and and engaged student in the entire class, but probably had the least amount to kind of give physically. And our elders always teach us, you know, that our kids can be our greatest teachers. We just need to have the ability to be able to quiet our mind and quiet our voices to be able to see them as teachers. And what he taught me is that as human beings, we have this innate desire to want to contribute to something outside of ourselves. And I also was remembered of that teaching uh, for people who actively use substances in community, because there's this kind of idea that if people are in a relationship with addiction, then they probably don't have a lot to offer the community. So why do we invite them or why do we engage with them? But if we want to emphasize a decolonial approach, you know, there are many things and aspects of community affairs and community ways of doing things that people with an active relationship with addiction can show up and provide. We just need to decolonize our thought processes and make safe spaces for, for people in active substances to be able to do so because of our innate desire to want to contribute to something outside of ourselves. As human beings, we're driven by a desire to want to contribute to something. Maybe that's why we showed up um, to this good work in healthcare. A sense of purpose, responsibility, generosity, emotions, and coming from a place of integrity. 
Um, the second component of decolonizing substance use is addressing misinformation. Um, and addressing misinformation is a huge uh, step in decolonization because it's just way too easy to pick up our phones and be exposed to all kinds of inaccurate information through social media and other uh, web platforms. So a big part of decolonizing substance use is uh, address myth busting. So these are some myths that we bust. Uh, myth number one, addiction is a choice. And if you really loved me, you would stop using substances. I don't know if any of you have seen that. It used to be a very popular uh, television documentary called Intervention where the whole family would gather around the person who was actively using substances and put love on the line and say, if you don't get your act together, then you're out. Um, which really, again, just reinforces the trauma, grief, loss, and daily stress that reinforces the addiction. Um, and so we back it by a fact. And the fact is, is that people, we don't choose to be addicted. We use addiction to feel good about a lot of bad crap that's happened. Um, and then just uh, uh, go back to our teachings on the roots of addiction and roots of connection. Myth number two, we just need to kick out all of the people who sell drugs out of the community and that will solve the problem. This will be like the most controversial myth that we bust at the community level. And I sweat a little bit every time I, I bust this myth um, because there will be some um, strong community members in the community who will say, Len, I don't think you're right. I think you're wrong there. I think if we get rid of my neighbor who is selling drugs to the community, and uh, I think that'll solve the problem. And I say, yes, maybe, but temporarily. It's kind of like that game whack-a-mole where the moles kind of keep, keep coming up and then you're trying to whack them down. Um, it's really, you know, when communities uh, take on like this, this prohibition policy of, of kicking out people who use substances or sell drugs, um, it's really microcosm of Canada's war on drugs. Only if we do that as First Nations communities, what we do is we adopt a war on our own people, um, people who are healing and people who are in a place of uh, still having needs um, to and access to healing and access to culture. And the analogy I always say is that, you know, selling drugs is a business. Uh, and like any business, you know, there's a supply and there's a demand. We can get rid of the supply, but there's this whole other demand that we haven't even begun to kind of scratch the surface of yet, which was everything that was reflected on the roots of addiction, the red map. Um, so we want to focus on more a harm reduction uh, effort rather than creating and adopting that, that war on drugs in our own community. It comes from well intentions, I know, but I still encounter it in my social media and news uh, attention all the time that leadership in acts of desire. And I fully respect that um, because every nation has its own sovereign right to implement its own affairs for how they see fit. But I don't think it puts the community in the safest space to be able to implement good life-saving and life quality improving measures uh, when it counts. So the fact is that prohibition doesn't work. Um, Canada's war on drugs is a multi-billion dollar um, science experiment that has, uh, costs millions of lives and continues to cost millions of lives. The um, uh, prohibition, uh, all uh, prohibition in Canada and in Western countries is rooted in racism. Um, and we have a whole curriculum piece on the, the uh, racism and, and prohibition in Canada. Um, if we take any illegal substance and we trace its origins for when it became illegal, we'll be uh, targeted at a minority culture uh, that it comes from, and that's why it's illegal. And there's a reason why tobacco and guns and, and alcohol are not illegal. Um, so it's important to again, take that more macro view of just where we are, even for us as indigenous peoples. Um, so prohibition doesn't work. Um, myth number three, I think, harm reduction enables substance use. Um, and this one uh, tugs at my heartstrings every time and hurts a little bit every time I, I, I hear it, um, because this is a very dangerous myth that harm reduction enables substance use, that if we're just given, um, you know, uh, naloxone out to everybody and we're given safer injection supplies out to everybody, then everybody's just going to be using substances. Um, kind of like condoms, right? And I, remember, you know, I remember hearing as a kid some folks who were like, well, if we just give condoms to everybody, then it's just going to encourage everybody to have sex everywhere. I'm like, okay, I think there's a little bit more to it than that. There's a broader context here. Um, so the fact is, is that harm reduction saves lives and improves the quality of life. And um, there's a, a good friend and colleague of ours, um, Jenny, who is a facilitator on our um, uh, not just in the Loxone facilitation team, and she says, yeah, 
harm reduction enables. It enables me to love my son, enables me to feed him, to uh, keep him alive um, and, and improve his quality of life. Um, and this is just a different way and spin in which I have looked at it and really appreciate that, that harm reduction can enable, enables the, the ability to save lives and improve the quality of life. Myth number four, all people who use substances are addicted. And then the fact here is there are four relationships uh, with substances. So remember when I was saying that a big part of decolonization is moving away from the pathologizing of indigenous peoples. Um, so there is this thing in, in, sub, in the substance use world called the substance use spectrum, where we have abstinence on one end of the spectrum, on the other end we have addiction, which I think reinforces this idea of the good bad binary, that if you're uh, abstinent, you're good. If you're addicted, mm, you're not so good. You're not in a really good place. So I didn't like that spectrum model because I thought it reinforced this good bad binary of people who are actively using substances and not really reflective of where we are in our own healing journeys as indigenous peoples, as homo peoples. So I put the, um, uh, that spectrum into a medicine wheel and said that there are four relationships that we can have with substances. We can be abstinent, we can be in medicinal use, uh, a medicinal relationship with uh, using substances. We can be in a recreational, meaning that we're weekend warriors or we use uh, substances once a year or only at concerts and raves, or you know we have the um, uh, glass of wine after a long day's uh, worth of work, which I will be doing later on today. Um, and, uh, or we could be in a relationship with addiction. And the reason for this, the intention for this was to make it more culturally relevant, but to really, again, move away from the othering of people who are actively using the substances. I used to be, when I was teaching um, NJN, I or teaching the Lachlan and community, I always say, you know, we're all in this together, we're all in this together. And there was this young matriarch in the North, um, an elder who said, Len, you keep saying we're all in this together, but I don't use substances, I'm abstinent, and I don't feel like I'm in it with, with everybody. I'm like, oh, okay. So I drew this medicine wheel on the board and I say, you might be abstinent. And I wrote, it, I drew out this quadrant and I said, but you might and probably do have loved ones, uh, whether the friends or family or colleagues who you love and care for, who will be in other parts of the quadrant. And harm reduction and decolonizing substance use work will help us to build a better community and be able to respond in a good way and in a healthy way and save lives and improve the quality of life for people in active substance use. She's like, oh, I get it. Okay. So again, we wanted to put it into a circle just to say that it's relational, that just because we're recreational or we're medicinal or we're abstinent doesn't mean that we know and love and care for somebody who's in an active relationship with addiction. Or, and also just to show and honor transformation and fluidity in our life journeys too, because we can be born abstinent, then move into recreational substance use, maybe as a teenager or a young adult. And then, you know, maybe in our adult years, we develop a relationship with addiction. Does it mean that we will stay there forever? By no means, not at all. We can move into medicinal or, or abstinence or recreational. So it's a little bit more fluid and flexible and inclusive for where we're at in our own healing journeys. And lastly, I think this is my last slide. Um, the last part of decolonizing substance use is again that destigmatizing, uh, decolonial uh, kind of language. So what we often hear is on the red uh, uh, part where we hear words like addict, user, and clean and sober. But what we want to encourage folks to say is people who use, uh, people first language, people who drink, people who smoke, uh, people who inject drugs, people with lived experience. Um, and then of course, instead of saying clean and sober, uh, we want to say, you know, people on their healing journey. And the reason for that is, you know, there's a really long relationship with, I mean, what are the implications when we're saying somebody's been clean and sober? What are the implications for people who are still actively using substances? That they're dirty. And we as Indigenous people have a very long relationship with being called dirty Indians. And I apologize for even uttering the words in a public Zoom call, but there is. And we as Indigenous people are very, you know, uh, words matter very much to us. So we want to move away from that clean and sober because of that implication for, you know, seeing people who use these substances as, as dirty. Um, rather, we say people in their healing journey. All the while, fully respecting people can identify who they choose, if that is their story to tell. So, you know, we hear this in, in, in meetings and, and conferences and community gatherings all the time, you know, people who stand up to speak and they say, hi, my name is Len Pierre. I've been clean and sober for 10 years. Uh, I would never say, what you mean to say is you've been on your healing journey for 10 years. I would never say that. 
Because if that is your lived experience, then that's your story to tell. But as healthcare providers and leaders in healthcare, we don't want to use that language to tell somebody else's story. That's Len. He's been on, he's been clean for 10 years. Um, he's so great. He's a great teacher. He's been clean for 10 years, clean and sober, right? Um, rather, you know, um, using the term healing journey, um, which we're starting to use. And that's it. I'm going to pause and stop sharing my screen and again, open up the floor. I think nobody else seems to want to talk. So <laughs> come on, people, speak up. Um, I think we're all, everyone on this call is on a healing journey. Everyone who's here listening to this, we're healing together from colonization and trauma and the way things have been. And I think that, um, you know, these, our organization is definitely moving in that direction of healing and we're really working towards anti-racism and um, trauma-informed. And I just heard a new term, uh, trauma and violence-informed care, which I need to dig a little deeper into and, and really think about what that means. Because it brings up some connotation, right? When you add that word violence in there. Um, but I, you know, and I, I just think I'm a very impatient person and I always want things done yesterday, but it, that's just not feasible. It's not feasible, but I, I do want to recognize that we, the organization FNHA is still a baby organization. We're what, seven years old? I think, um, yeah, I do really feel like we're moving in the right direction. Um, it's, it's baby stuff and we're all healing together and we're all loving together and we're all willing to be here together, which I think is amazing. I totally agree. And even while we are a baby organization, we're like still a, a leader in innovation um, and, and inclusivity and, and all of those things that, that we're very passionate about. I mean, we are the leading example of, of transformation and what a healthcare organization uh, can and ought to do. Um, which is a huge celebration and a huge thing to hold in gratitude. Um, uh, so I love that, even though we're so young, we're, we're, we're um, leading the change, uh, so to speak. Um, and on the topic of you know, trauma and viol violence informed um, practice, we had that as a, a curriculum piece in not just Naloxone um, as well. And we have since in a decolonial approach, uh, leaned more towards uh, trauma and resiliency informed practice. Um, to honor that resiliency framework and then move away from the less pathologizing because it should not be just trauma informed alone um, because then it's like who am I to say you know you are so you know poor indigenous peoples that are rooted in indigenous uh, racial trauma um, historical trauma and those kinds of things so um, in NJN we talk about trip trauma and resiliency informed practice Okay, I recognize we are in the home stretch of a weekend. Um, and if there are no burning questions, I'm not seeing anybody's reaction buttons or hands going up or anything. So I think, oh, yes, Jennifer. Uh, for your presentation. Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Oh, I'm not no, going to turn my camera off. You can just see the the blackheads in my nose, <laughs> but um, so I just wanted to um, ask you for next steps because this is such great information. I know that our nurses in community really need this type of training, this type, these types of talks. And um, as a PC, I really want to incorporate this into my work when I orientate and talk with nurses uh, throughout their careers. And so I was just wondering if there's um, sort of maybe plans of how we could do that as an organization to 
nursing school um, historically and currently just doesn't do a good job at teaching this stuff. So Hi, Chika. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I mean, completely uh, agree. I am not sure in terms of, of um, next steps. Um, I think that it would be probably up to each and every one of us to kind of think about and, and think critically about, um, depending on how this is landing with, with the group, with the, the committee here, uh, to think about and entertain that conversation moving forward, if, if you would like. I am happy to participate. I go wherever I'm invited. So if, if you found that worthy, I'm happy to, you know, think about that a little bit more. Absolutely. I see you talking, Kirsten, but <laughs> you're muted. No? Can you hear me now? OK, there we go. Cue mute buttons to deal with. Um, I was just going to add that we have gotten a lot of other requests for um, NJN programming directly to nurses. So figuring out how to do that. We've also heard that two days is a lot of time um, with busy schedules. So how to maybe even break up some of the curriculum into sizable chunks and incorporate that into um, working with the professional practice team into the competencies. So that will be part of regular onboarding. So we're definitely thinking the same thing. I know in the short term, um, we've got some scheduled NJN trainings coming up and we would like to open that up to the collaborative practice team as well. So maybe after this call, uh, we'll send out a little bit more information about when those trainings are happening. I just wanted to say I'm uh, at noon, uh, Len. Uh, it's refreshing to hear you as well, and uh, as usual, and um, and to have to have, have these kind of spaces. Uh, I find as um, as an allegate as an indigenous person myself, it's uh, it's very challenging working in FNHA because it's it's very I'm just going to say it's very colonized, and often can be alienating because of the the structure it represents, and uh, it doesn't we we, can, we don't see ourselves in the organization that's supposed to be for us by us and. As one of the former FNH leaders used to say, nothing about us without us. And, uh, you know, that we don't hear that these days. And so that's a big gap that's missing. And I often see, uh, it's, it's grateful to see somebody ask a question about indigenizing versus decolonizing, because often you see, um, you, you hear words like um, apply First Nations lens versus Indigenous led. And that, that's often coming up and it, it really perpetuates uh, that colonialist conformity. So, uh, and these kind of these kind of spaces holding is really um, you know eye opening for for our, our, our allies to help um, dismantle those those practices that that, that happen and show up and it's it's a long way to go but I think uh, you know we're, we're at a critical time and um, yeah more of these e events and gatherings and, and sharing of knowledge is is really going to help us yeah so so wait you go thank you hi Chika thank you so much Justin. So with that, thank you each and every one of you for um, inviting me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for engaging. Thank you for typing in the chat box or unmuting yourself and, and leaning into this conversation. Um, I would like to, in a very decolonial way, uh, close off in a good way and leave you with a prayer um, with the intention that you leave what you need behind and you take only the good aspects that you need for your weekend. Um, and, the, and hopefully nobody has to work after this, but if you do, then you don't have to take this with you. Um, take only what you need, okay? Is that okay? Does that sound okay for folks? Okay. So to close off with a closing prayer, uh, to really take care of you, I wanna take care of you in this moment and thank you for this work too. Just take a moment to get yourself back into your body. So firmly plant your feet on the ground, relax your shoulders, let your belly relax. Soften your jaw. If it's comfortable for you, you can go ahead and close your eyes. If not, just soften your gaze or look away from the computer. Let the tongue drop from the roof of your mouth just for a second. And just focus on your own breath for a moment. 
what a wonderful moment it is that we as an organization can pause and be together with good work and just be. Let's be thankful for this moment and just take this moment. Who knows, maybe this is the only moment you get that is just for you out of your entire day. Go ahead and own it. Relax. Throughout this prayer, go ahead and pray in your own way, in your own language, but do so with giving thanks and holding a space of gratitude in your heart today so that you move into your weekend light, lightly, gently. Good grandmothers, good grandfathers, creator of all good things, it is us, your children. We give you thanks for this beautiful day. We ask in a good way, in a humble way, to have good encounters for the rest of our day today. Give, we give thanks for the beautiful air that we breathe, the clean water that we drink, the nourishing food we have access to, and the incredible strength of the territories on which we live, work, and play. We ask creator that you take care of those who cannot be here today. Bless our thoughts and our, our hearts so that we leave what no longer serves us here in this moment and not carry it with us into the weekend. All my relations, heights up, Cassian. Thank you, everybody. I hope you all have a great restful weekend. Take care of yourselves. It's never goodbye. It's until we see each other again. So until next time, take care. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank Len. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everybody. Len, thank you so much. I don't know if Len's still on. <laughs> Hi, Debbie. Hi, Len. There he is. <laughs> Thank you, Len.